So the Gulf of Maine over this 10 year period uh, experienced a temperature increase that, that very few large marine ecosystems have ever experienced. So it's a really remarkable change and it gives us this opportunity to really try to understand how an ecosystem responds to warming. Thank you, Nigella. It's, it is great to be here. Thank you all for spending your uh, Thursday evening. I guarantee this will be a lot more fun than the debate, uh, at least for me, until maybe until the question and answer. Uh, so my name is Andy Pershing. Uh, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, which is up in Portland, Maine. Uh, I took the job as a Chief Science Officer, mostly because that was Spock's title on the Enterprise. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with just a little bit about the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and, and then a little bit about the Gulf of Maine Research Institute and the work that we do. And then I'll get into the most of the, the, the talk, which is really about climate change, how it's impacting the Gulf of Maine, uh, how it's impacting many of the species that we care about, including some that are very important uh, economically and culturally in this region. And then starting to think about what does that mean for adaptation? What are the lessons that we can learn from the Gulf of Maine as one of the fastest warming places in the global ocean? What can that tell us about adaptation and how, what are the lessons that we can learn that we can start to uh, tell the rest of the world. So this is the Gulf of Maine. Uh, as you can tell, it's a gulf, right? That it is sort of enclosed, right? There's a, there's a circular area. And, and by the way, when I was a kid, uh, I didn't realize that the Gulf of Maine was a gulf. I didn't learn that until I, I came to college. And what I realized I was missing in my life uh, was Canada. Uh, that mo all of the maps in my, uh, I guess in my grade school, uh, ended with Maine, and so I didn't realize that that you know can't, that Nova Scotia kind of uh, you know looped around. Uh, but anyway, the Gulf of Maine is a really uh, is a really special place. It includes uh, uh, you know the sh the shoreline of Maine where I live right now, but it also includes. Uh, uh, you know, the shores here of Massachusetts is a very important part of the Gulf of Maine. And it also includes Canada. So, so managing the species here and the, the people that depend on it uh, involves collaborating between three states, Maine, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. Yes, they have a coastline in New Hampshire, uh, and as well as New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And then the two, the governments of the US and Canada. So it's very complex politically. It's very complex in terms of its geography. We have these deep basins in the middle of the Gulf of Maine. We have the shallow uh, George's Bank here, and then we have the deep water uh, offshore. So this is the Gulf of Maine Research Institute where I work. It's in Portland, Maine. You should come and visit. Uh, GMRI focuses on the science, education, and community. We're the only institution in the region that is focused on the Gulf of Maine, and that is our sole mission, is to understand not only how the Gulf of Maine works, but to then apply that knowledge to help the communities uh, that make their living on, uh, on the resources in the Gulf of Maine, as well as to educate people about that. Uh, so I run our science program, which takes an approach that I like to call physics to fish sticks. So we go all the way from the physics of the ecosystem and the oceanography and uh, accounting for the productivity. We then really take a, a really hard look at, at many of the important commercial species in the region. Uh, and then we bring that up to people. So we have an economist on our team. We have a conservation engineer who works with the fishing industry to try to make the practice of fishing more uh, efficient and more sustainable. We also have a community program, and this is probably what we're best known for outside of, uh, uh, outside of Maine, uh, in that we do work with the fishing industry to really try to add value and to try to bring extra value to the fishery products here in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, so we're, we're dealing with this environment where, uh, where quotas for many of our fish need to be reduced uh, in order to have sustainable fisheries. And so that creates an economic challenge for a lot of the fishermen and, their, and the, you know, the people that depend on them. Uh, and so we're really trying trying to bring a premium to the, the, the fish products coming from this region to try to make this, uh, the fisheries more sustainable. And finally, we have an education program. And this is really focused on the state of Maine. We bring 70% uh, of Maine's fifth and sixth graders through our doors every year, uh, which sounds like a lot if you're from Massachusetts. But in Maine, it's, uh, it's about 10,000 kids. So it's a lot, but uh, it would be a little compared to 70,000 or 70% 70 here in, Maine, or in Massachusetts. So this is just a scene of a beautiful harbor in Maine. You'll notice the commercial fishing boats as well as the recreational boats. Uh, here we're flying over, uh, over an island, looking at a vessel on the water. Uh, this is a colony where turned, so we have birds and lots of animals that are migrating here in order to make their living. We have really interesting animals in the water, including this basking shark that's coming here to feed on the copepods that, uh, uh, that I uh, hold very dear to me. Um, 
Uh, and then we'll move on to a photo. This is the uh, Gulf Challenger, which is the research vessel operated by the University of New Hampshire. And our scientists, together with scientists from another uh, bunch of other institutions, uh, did some cruises that went from Cape Cod Bay all the way to, uh, uh, to the uh, Nova Scotia border, uh, looking at the Gulf of Maine, everything from the physics of the ocean all the way up to the birds, and really trying to understand what makes this so productive. Uh, so here we are uh, launching the drone, uh, getting a look now at, at the water. And you can really see, I think, you know, a, a little bit of why we think the Gulf of Maine is such a special, uh, a, a special place. So it's a special place, but it's also a place that's changing rapidly. So this is the annual temperature cycle from the Gulf of Maine. The black line would be the average from uh, over the period 1982 through 2011. So obviously you see that we have uh, a peak in temperature that occurs right in uh, uh, late August. Um, we have you know, our temperature minimum that occurs in May. Well, uh, 2012 was our record year in the Gulf of Maine. We call it the ocean heat wave. And so that's the thin black line that's way above that blue area that's kind of the max and min over that 30-year period. You can see that in 2016, we are fighting really hard with 2012 uh, over who's going to end up as the, the warmest year uh, in the Gulf of Maine. So why is it that the Gulf of Maine is warming? Well, the story starts with carbon dioxide. So this is the famous Keeling curve that I hope uh, all of you by now have, have seen. Uh, David Keeling started collecting carbon dioxide measurements uh, in 1958. Uh, and I think he was one of the geniuses of the 20th century, not so much because he decided uh, that it would be really important to measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but because he was somehow able to persuade his bosses at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography that he really needed to do this in Hawaii. Uh, so he spent his career measuring carbon dioxide uh, and really grappling with the consequences of that. And he then passed on to his son in one of the few things that, uh, few uh, examples of this I've seen in science where, where you get this kind of familial transfer uh, of this responsibility. And his son has been responsible for maintaining this, uh, this time series. And this was really the best record of carbon dioxide in the modern era. So it starts in 1958. Uh, this uh, graph here goes through 2015. You see the steady increase in the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere going from about 315 uh, to just over 400. We now have crossed the point where every year we have this annual cycle uh, that, that has to do with basically the, the planet breathing. Uh, and we're now to the point where even during the winter when we hit that, uh, that minimum, where we're going to be above 400 for the foreseeable future. And there's no signs that this is abating. But it's hard to put this into perspective. And that's where uh, I think the, you know, the, the data that we can get from the ice cores becomes really, really important. So this is data that goes back 20,000 years before present. Uh, so you see that during the ice age, that gray bar uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the left there, that was the ice age. The carbon dioxide levels were lower in the ice age. We then had a shift in the, uh, in the orbit of the Earth led to increased uh, solar radiation, but just a tiny little bit. That started the process of melting the glaciers. As the glaciers started to melt, uh, you started to open up more of the ocean. You started to warm up the ocean. The ocean started to release the CO2 that it was storing. That goes into the atmosphere, and that accelerates the warming. And so you get this feedback loop where the planet is warming and CO2 is increasing as the CO2 is starting to come out of the ocean. And so those are working together to recover uh, our planet from the ice age. So notice 10,000 years ago how flat that curve is, that how from 10,000 years until about 18, uh, 1850 or so, CO2 levels were flat. And global temperatures were remarkably stable during that period. And that's a really important part, a really important uh, part of our planet's history, at least from the point of view of humans, because that's when we began to learn to do things like, well, prior to 10,000 years ago, humans were around, but there weren't very many of us, and we were doing things like hunting and gathering. 10,000 years ago, we started to learn how to grow crops. We started to learn how to live in cities. We started to build economies that, built, that were built on trade. Uh, we started to build cities that were located along coastlines that relied on the fact that sea level was stable. Uh, and so now you can see that the uptick that started uh, in the 1800s, and uptick is an, obviously an understatement where you just see CO2 going off the charts. And so you see that the, that the change in CO2 between the, that kind of stable climate period and now is roughly equivalent to the change in CO2 between the ice age and that stable period. So it's a remarkable impact that, uh, that this carbon dioxide is having on the planet. 
And of course, we're, we're used to thinking, we hear about climate change and the connection to carbon dioxide and the impact on, uh, of carbon dioxide on global warming. And we tend to think of it as a, as a modern phenomenon. Maybe you think that you know, Al Gore invented, invented it in 2000, shortly after he invented the internet. Uh, it was an election joke for those of you older than uh, 20. Um, uh, maybe you think of it as a, you know, a Chinese conspiracy that was invented a few years ago. Uh, but I assure you that, that the scientific community has really been grappling with the impact of carbon dioxide on the planet for a really long time. The science of global warming goes way back to people like Svante Arrhenius uh, uh, you know, around the turn of the century. And they were able to, to start to figure out that having carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was essential to the climate that we have, to making the Earth a habitable planet. Well, in 1965, uh, about seven years after Keeling started making his observations, uh, a panel of uh, the President's Science Advisory Committee that include Keeling's uh, boss, uh, Roger Revelle from, uh, from Scripps, warned President Johnson that rising carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere would almost certainly cause significant changes in the temperature and other properties of the stratosphere, and that these changes could be deleterious from the point of human beings. So they knew enough about the relationship between carbon dioxide and global temperatures to be able to say that continuing to, imp to, to put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere created this risk of changes. But they couldn't say quantitatively what was going to happen. So another 20 or 30 years of science, and you get this fellow, James Hansen, in 1981. Uh, and Hansen is one of my heroes for a lot of reasons. But in 1981, Hansen published a paper in Science Magazine where he took one of the, the at the time, was a state-of-the-art climate model. Right now, it would be a very simple, uh, very basic sort of climate model. But this is, at the time, was the state-of-the-art model. And he was modeling the impact that carbon dioxide would have on the planet. And his results said that anthropogenic carbon dioxide, so carbon dioxide from humans, uh, that, that the warming due to that would uh, emerge from the noise level of natural climate variability by the end of the century. What that means is that, we, that scientists should be able to look at the data at the end of the 20th century and clearly see a trend in temperature, clearly see that we live on a warming planet. Uh, and furthermore, that this would lead to creation of drought-prone regions of North America and Central A Asia, and that it would lead to an opening of the Northwest Passage. Okay, but he was a little, uh, a little fuzzy on when that would happen. He was not making precise predictions, but he was saying that quantitatively, we're going to be able to, uh, to tell that, that global warming is real and caused by humans right about the year 2000. So let's test James's theory. Uh, so this is the data that, uh, that James Hansen would have had at the time when he wrote his paper. So you can see that uh, in 1981 or 1982 that, that the temperature was, uh, at the time, a record going uh, back to, to 1880 to the start of the, uh, of the instrumental record. But it wasn't that much higher than, you know, than a particular warm year that we had at right about 1946 or so. Uh, and so it'd be hard to say. Statistically, there's a bit of a trend, but it would be really hard to, to say that that trend was, wasn't due to maybe some sort of uh, long-scale natural cycle. Now, this is where I want to diverge a little bit uh, and, and tell a little bit of a personal story. And this gets to my relationship with the aquarium. Um, so I was a small boy uh, in 1981, 1982, uh, growing up uh, in the great ocean state of Nebraska. Okay, uh, as far away as you can get from the ocean and still without really leaving the planet. I was fascinated, even as a 10-year-old boy, in the ocean. This is what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be a marine biologist, but I really didn't know what that meant. And one of the ways that I had this connection with the ocean was, it was in fact, through the work of the aquarium. At the time, and hopefully some of you here will remember this, uh, the aquarium, in, aquarium played a pivotal role in the life of a seal, Andre the Seal, who used to spend his winters here at the New England Aquarium. And then he would be released, and he would swim back to his home in Maine, uh, where he was uh, uh, kind of the companion of a, uh, uh, of a, a guy in Rock, uh, Rockport, Maine, named Harry Goodrich. And I was fascinated by Andre the Seal. My mom would clip out the newspaper clippings, and I would come home from school, and I'd be so excited if, if there was news of Andre the Seal. So in 1983, uh, my parents were, uh, I was lucky enough that my parents took me to the aquarium. So there's me. 
and there's me with a sea cucumber. So I was able to like come to the aquarium. I was able to see the fish that I was you know, seeing on Jacques Cousteau. I was able to touch things like sea cucumbers that I was reading about and I was fascinated about. But I was so disappointed. Uh, there were a few tears before this happy moment with the sea cucumber because we got here in May and Andre the seal had just left. Oh, I know. But my parents are amazing. And so we rented a car. And we drove to Maine, and so here's me, my brother, and there's Andre the Seal. So, so yeah, thanks, uh, applause for my parents. So this was just one of these great moments in parenting uh, um, that you know, was really important in my life. So the aquarium I, has always been a really special place to me. Uh, and as Nigella said, you know, it came up for me in college. Uh, where I was, went to college in Providence. I would come up here with my girlfriend, who later became my wife, do things like uh, you know, observe the penguins uh, for our animal behavior class, um, and then later on uh, working with the, the right whale team. So um, thank you very much uh, to all of you who have supported the aquarium. OK, back to our story. So we have the temperature record uh, in 1981. We re it's really hard to say whether we're warming. Now, uh, moving on into you know, 1995 or so, this is right when I'm graduating from college and going on to grad school. Yes, you can see that there's maybe starting to be a trend. But I don't know, 95 was a little cold in the 96, so maybe we're cooling down, right? OK, by the year 2000, I'm now graduating with my PhD. And this is the time when James says we should be able to look at the data and see that there's a clear signal, that there's a clear warming trend in the data. And I think if you can look at this graph, uh, you could do it statistically. But just looking at this graph, you see that I think there's a very strong trend in the temperature. And of course, that's only continued. So 2015 was the warmest year on record. 2016 is on pace to, to eclipse 2015. It's, uh, NASA yesterday said that it's all but certain that we will eclipse 2015. So very, very warm uh, temperatures here on this planet. We're seeing conditions that we really haven't seen for, for hundreds of thousands of years. And of course, many of the other things that James Hansen was talking about are, we're also talking about. We're wondering about, uh, about the ongoing drought in the southwest and the water levels in Lake Mead, which is what, we're what I'm showing on the, right, or on the left. On the right is the graph of sea ice uh, in the Arctic, which has been on a downward trend. Uh, and then there was a headline from last summer that warming opens the famous uh, Northwest Passage to navigation. This year was the first year that there was a cruise ship that went through the Northwest Passage. We had a big conference in Portland uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about the, Im the implications that that has, not only for Maine and for America, but also for, uh, for the world. So this is, this is the world that we're living with. And this isn't some abstract thing. This isn't new. I, I really want to point out that this is entirely consistent with what scientists were predicting 30 years ago. So that gives us some confidence, at least for me, that we can take the, 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 you know, the, uh, the successors to the computer models that James uh, Hansen was playing with. And we can now make projections going on to the, uh, into the future uh, and hopefully do a really good job with that. Uh, so there are really are two futures that we can think about here, or at least that I'm depicting on this graph. There's the red one, which shows global average temperatures increasing to about 4 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. And we get there if we continue to emit carbon at the same rate that we're emitting them. If we reduce our carbon emissions and we do it rapidly and quickly, we end up with the blue curve where we stabilize uh, at roughly about 1 and a half, uh, degrees of warming. Uh, now, what, what I want you to notice, though, is how the red and the blue curves don't really diverge until maybe 2030 or 2040. So we have really about 20 years where, in some ways, what we do with carbon doesn't matter. And this is what makes the, car, the climate change problem so challenging, is because we're really talking about making changes in our lives now to reap the benefits 30 or 40 years from now, right? passing it on to our kids uh, and our grandkids. Where right now, the 20 year period that we're looking at is all about adaptation. It's how do we deal with the trends that we're, uh, that we're on because the cake is already baked. We are now adjusting to the, to the uh, carbon dioxide that was emitted into the atmosphere during the 1990s when Nirvana was still a band. OK, moving on to the Gulf of Maine. So this is the temperature record from the Gulf of Maine. You'll notice it's much noisier than the one I showed where we're averaging over the planet. And that's because we're zooming in on a smaller part of the world. It's also because I'm showing you the weekly data, not just the, the yearly data. 
If you look at the yearly data, the gray bars, you see that there's still quite a bit of noise. So in the 1980s, we have something that looks kind of like a four or five year cycle. Uh, we take a jump up right around the year 2000. And then, we, and then we start to go on uh, uh, quite a bit uh, higher temperatures uh, in the late uh, 20 teens. Uh, if you fit a trend, uh, this is the trend that we have, 0.04 degrees Celsius per year or 0.07 degrees Fahrenheit for you Americans in the audience. Uh, this is hard to put in perspective. The way to think of this is relative to the other trends that we have on the planet. And in the ocean, the average trend is 0.01 degrees Celsius per year, or 0.018 degrees Fahrenheit per year. So our warming trend is four times, four times the global average trend. Okay, much so four times faster than the rest of the ocean. If you look at this period, 2004 through 2013, we warmed at almost a quarter of a degree Celsius per year. That is a tr that's a, a, a really remarkable trend, okay? And, and the statistics that I'm going to show you work out even if you kind of slide the, the window forward and think about the 10 years uh, going from 2005 or 2006. Now, if we take that 2004, that trend line, and we map the slope, so red is going to be an air, a pixel. I'm going to color it red if it has a positive slope, if it's warming. I'm going to color it blue if it's actually cooled over that period. And over a 10-year period, you're going to see some places that warm and some places that, that cool. Uh, you see that the Gulf of Maine is glowing bright red. Uh, you also see that there are a few other red areas. There's a red area north of Japan. There's a red area north of Norway. Uh, there's a lot of red off of Australia. Okay? If you look at this in terms of a histogram, in terms of the area of the planet that's, that's warming at a particular rate, you see that the mean of that, right, the center of that peak is right at that 0.01 degrees, right what I said was our long-term mean. Uh, we, have a few, uh, we have a few areas that are cooling, a few areas that are warming, but there are more that are warming than are cooling. Uh, but if you look at the areas that are warming, the Gulf of Maine, I highlighted out there, we're way out there on the limb. So over that 10-year period, the Gulf of Maine warmed faster than 99% of the planet, okay, of the global ocean. Uh, you can also look over a longer record. You can take any 10-year period from anywhere in the global ocean going back to uh, 1900, and you get a very similar curve. So the Gulf of Maine, over this 10-year period, uh, experienced a temperature increase that, that very few large marine ecosystems have ever experienced. So it's a really remarkable change, and it gives us this opportunity to really try to understand how an ecosystem responds to warming. Before we look at the ecosystems, though, why are we warming so quickly? Well, we are at a, a really interesting place on the globe in that we're right on this boundary between warm water and cold water. So you can think of the Gulf of Maine like a bathtub that has two faucets, one for the cold water and one for the warm water. Uh, we, the cold water comes in from Canada, and that's that blue, area, blue arrow. Uh, the, red, the warm water comes in from offshore, and that's the kind of pinkish arrow. And the big red arrow at the bottom is the, is the Gulf Stream, which is a major ocean current that moves a ton of heat on the planet. Uh, what we see uh, is that uh, over the last 10 years, the Gulf Stream has trended further north. And along with that, we've seen a decrease in the, in the cool water coming into the Gulf of Maine and an increase in the warm water. So the, the warming in the Gulf of Maine is really due to the change in the circulation in this region. There's also an atmospheric component that I'm not showing. Um, but we've had generally warmer atmospheric conditions as well, so more heating as well as this change in the water masses. Why do we think that this is, why am I telling you that this is a global warming story, right? Ten years is a very short period of time to really be talking about global climate change. Climate change we really think of as playing out over these 20 or 30 year uh, uh, periods. Well, so this is the map that we had uh, in our paper showing the warming trends uh, from 2004 through 2013. This is a map uh, that, uh, that I put together from some data uh, that was run by uh, uh, some folks at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab in Princeton. They ran a really, really high resolution climate model. It's the only climate model that can actually resolve the currents that are feeding the temperature in the Gulf of Maine. And what I did was I took the average warming trend over that whole map, okay, and I divide all of the pixels by that average trend. And so on that map, a gray area isn't an area that's cooling. It's an area that's warming, but it's warming less than the global average rate. A red area is an area that's warming, 
and it's warming faster than the global average rate. And you'll notice how the spatial pattern is incredibly similar, especially in the North Atlantic, where in the North Atlantic we have the warm uh, in the west, in the Gulf of Maine, in the Mid-Atlantic, and that we have the blue, the cooler, or the slightly, or the, the, you know, the areas that aren't warming as quickly south of Greenland. So the same spatial pattern that they see in their long-term climate simulation, this is what we've seen in the North Atlantic over the last 10 years. This connects to global climate change in a really interesting way. It, it's related to the large-scale circulation of the North Atlantic. Basically, as we warm up the planet, we're melting Greenland. We're putting fresh water into the ocean uh, in places like the Labrador Sea. Fresh water is light. Uh, so even though we have a colder, uh, what happens is that we have less cooling, or sorry, the fresh water in, uh, creates a strong density contrast. So we're not able to make really dense water that will sink to the bottom of the ocean. That dense water is what pulls the Gulf Stream up into that region. And so when that particular circulation pattern slows down and becomes less, uh, uh, less active, the around and around circulation becomes more active and it tends to kind of kick the Gulf Stream into the Gulf of Maine and it reduces the cold water that comes into our region. And so we end up warming uh, quickly. So uh, I'm going to now switch gears and talk a little bit about some of the ecosystem impacts that we've had. So cod's an incredibly important fish. It's, it's the most important fish uh, uh, in the United States, I would argue. Um, you know, we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving in about a month, you know, the survival of the colony uh, in, in, you know, in the Plymouth Plantation. They survived in part, of course, by, uh, by the generosity of their Native American neighbors, but they also survived, especially that first winter, because they sent boats to Monhegan Island in Maine to beg fish, to beg salted cod from the fishing colony, the fishing station that, that was established there. Cod were the most important resource in the, uh, in the colonial days in America. Britain made more money off of codfish exported from New England than Spain made money off of the gold that they were getting out of, uh, uh, out of the um, uh, South America. So it was, it was really important for the, uh, the early economics of, the, of our country. But it's continued to be a really important resource in this region. In the 1800s, in the late 1800s, around 1880, uh, uh, there were 70,000 tons of cod landed in Maine, right? 70,000 tons of fish. Store that number in your memory, 70,000 uh, in the late 1800s. This, uh, two years ago, the catch limits that were approved for a Gulf of Maine cod were 350 tons, okay? A huge, huge decline in this really important fishery. So why is that? Well, here's the, uh, the, 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 rec the biomass of cod, right? The total quantity of reproducing cod that are in the Gulf of Maine starting in 1980. So you can really see the decline. You can see that we were higher in 1980. Uh, you can see that we, were, you know, we reached record low levels, 3% of what we think of as the target biomass uh, in 2014. That decline was related to a decline in what fisheries scientists call recruitment. So this is the number of new fish that are entering the population. We measure that at, uh, for age one fish, so one-year-old fish. Uh, and you can see that that also declines as well. And that makes sense, right? If you have fewer females out there in the world to make babies, you're going to have fewer babies. But I want you to also notice, the, and, and if you look at the peak that occurs right around, uh, looks like right around 1988, how that's followed by a peak in the spawning stock biomass in the blue curve right around 1990. So there's a, if you have these big pulses of recruitment, that leads to a lot of fish three or four years later. OK, so recruitment is really important. So we did a, a bit of a thought experiment where we took a, all of the data going up through 2004 and we used that to fit a statistical model that related the spawning stock biomass to recruitment. So we're, what we're trying to do is predict the one-year-old fish from the number of females in a given year. Uh, and then we did a similar model, but we added a temperature effect. And in this period up to 2004, those models perform more or less the same. The temperature one is slightly better, but not in, in, a, in a really meaningful way. But if we take those two models and then we project them forward, uh, and we're confronting them now with data that they haven't seen, the model that, that doesn't include temperature, that only includes the spawning stock biomass, greatly overestimates the amount of recruitment that we would have had. 
uh, whereas the one that includes temperature actually gets the decline correct. Okay, says that, in fact, we should have fewer cod in the Gulf of Maine because we're going to get less reproduction from the females that are there. Now, the fisheries management is supposed to be a neg what we call a negative feedback loop. Negative in the sense that if there's a change in the stock and the fish that are in the middle of the screen, if that population goes down, we run them through a process called the so uh, stock assessment where scientists basically count the fish. We figure out how many there are. We pass that through the management process and we end up with quotas that are, should be reduced in order to allow the fish to rebuild. Okay? So it's supposed to work that way. Um, during uh, the, the, uh, the 2000s, when we were in this, uh, this warming period, what was happening was that the stock was changing faster than this management cycle could pick up on. And key among, key, the key, one of the key things was that our stock assessments were not accounting for temperature. They weren't accounting for the simple fact that cod are a subpolar species that's living at the ed of, edge of its range and that if you warm it up, they're not going to be as productive uh, as they used to be. So by not taking that into account, we ended up uh, producing quotas and giving advice to the fishing industry, telling them that it was okay to fish at this level when in fact they should have been fishing at this level. And so even though fishermen did their part and stayed within the limits, we ended up overfishing anyway and it accelerated the collapse of the, uh, of the fishery. But it's not all, it's not all negative. Okay, we think there's actually some positives here, and that's if we start to take into account temperature, we can come with, up with a more realistic uh, portrayal of what this fishery could be. So the dashed line at the top is at 55,000 tons of spawning stock biomass. This is what the current fishery management uh, target is. This is where we want cod to be. Notice how it's lower than the 70,000 tons of fish that we were removing in the 1800s. Just shows you how, how vastly the scale of this population has shifted in the course of uh, you know, the history of our country. Um, so the, the little curve on the lower left, that's where we're at. So we have a long way to go to get to that management target. But that management target is, I would say, uh, unrealistic. And that's because it doesn't take into account temperature. In a warmer environment, cod are going to be less productive, and so their carrying capacity goes down. So our target biomass level should also go down, and so that's what I'm depicting in the blue curve. Now we'd like to think about, okay, what do we have to do to rebuild cod? And by rebuilding, that means that we're going to allow the population to grow to the point where it's going to intersect with that blue curve. Okay, well in order to do that, we actually have to now grapple with the fact that we are, that there's uncertainty around what the future will bring. Exactly how quickly are we going to warm over the next uh, 20 or 30 years. So we use three scenarios. The blue line at the bottom is warming, but it's one of the coolest or the, the least warmingest scenarios uh, that we get from the recent climate model simulations. The black line is the mean of all of those climate simulations. And the red line is if we take the, the current trend in the Gulf of Maine, our 30 year trend, the, the one that's four times the global average rate, and we continue on that trend. And that's probably, that's similar to, to what we get from the high resolution climate models. But these three temperature scenarios sort of bracket what we think of as our possible future. So if we go with the mean scenario, right, the, the average temperature, and if we fish at a moderate, at a, at, a, at, a, at a low level, so we allow some fishing but not a lot of fishing, uh, we get a population that increases. You notice how that by 2030, we're talking about a fishery that's bigger than anything we've had in 30 years. Okay? So this stock can be rebuilt. We would say that this stock would rebuild right about 2028. Okay? The interesting point, so that in some ways that's victory. That would be an incredible achievement if we got there. Uh, uh, under the, the US fishery management policy, we're supposed to get there, we're supposed to try to get there in 10 years. And our work suggests that that's very unrealistic, even if there's no fishing. But a modest amount of fishing and modest warming, uh, we can get there in kind of the late 2020s. But we have to grapple with the fact that it could be a little cooler, it could be a little warmer than that. And you might look at the, the lower curve, the one with the crosses. That's the curve that coincides with the rapid warming scenario. 
And you might look at that and you say, well, maybe we should be cheering for rapid warming because if we warm quickly, then we're going to hit our target earlier, right? It looks like that intersects with the black curve right around 2025. Well, the problem is that if we have uh, uh, warmer temperatures, the cod are also going to grow more slowly. And so we don't rebuild until 2034 or so in that rapid warming scenario. So we really have to think about trade-offs between fishing and temperature. And of course, we can only control fishing. We can't control temperature. Uh, but at least by thinking about it, we begin to get a little bit more realism about what the scale of this fishery could be. Uh, there are the, the yellow dots are where we would get if there was no fishing according to our model. So we, we could come close to getting that 10-year time horizon, but at a, at a really huge uh, socioeconomic cost to uh, the people who are in the industry. So uh, in summary, uh, warming uh, leads to reduce recruitment and reduce survival in uh, cod in the Gulf of Maine, but not accounting for the warming made management very difficult. Uh, cod, we think, can be rebuilt, but the rate and the level is going to depend on the temperatures that we get in the Gulf of Maine. Okay, so lobster. Lobster are a little bit of a different story. Um, uh, lobster right now are one of the success stories in U.S. fisheries. Uh, the fishery in Maine alone, and of course the fishery takes place in Massachusetts, it takes place in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, the fishery in Maine alone was worth half a billion dollars. This is a huge, huge industry. In Maine, where I come from, 75% of the landed value of all of our fishery products are the single species. Okay, so huge dependence in many of our smaller coastal communities on the single fishery. We've seen dramatically increasing catches in Maine, uh, but we've seen decreasing catches in southern New England, so in Rhode Island uh, and also a little bit in, in Massachusetts as well. Uh, so here's the, the landage trajectories, just so you can see a little bit of the scale of the fishery. So Maine is at the top, right? We are really reaping the benefits of the, the lobster boom right now. Massachusetts has generally been stable. Uh, Rhode Island, it's a little bit hard to see. It's the yellow curve, uh, sorry, it's the green curve there that was high, and it's essentially, that fishery is basically collapsed. It's essentially closed uh, south of Cape Cod right now. And I just want to show you another way of thinking of this population. So this is an animation, and I'll play it, and, and it'll probably be a little weird. Uh, it's on my Twitter feed. It's on, pinned on my Twitter feed, uh, page if you want to check it out. Um, so there are a couple of things that are going to go on here. So the first, you'll see the three lobsters that are out in the ocean. Those represent three components of the population that scientists track, one in uh, southern New England, one on Georgia's bank, and then the big one right now uh, in the Gulf of Maine. And then you see the states. Each state, uh, I'm going to represent the landings by each state. And so the size of the state is going to change uh, based on how the landings change relative to 1981. So you're going to see some big changes. Uh, I warn you, New York is going to get big. It'll get a little bit scary, but I, I can assure you that, that New York will get put in its place in due time. Um, OK, so let me start this. So there, 1987, right, New York is, is really starting to boom. Maine has actually shrunk a little bit relative to 1981. So 1992, we're kind of at peak lobster in, uh, in, in Connecticut and Massachusetts. Right, oh, there we are, peak lobster. Okay, so now 2004. Right, you're starting to see a decline in southern New England. The decline there really starts about two, uh, right around 1999, 2000, uh, when we started, when we had kind of our first jump in temperature in the region. And then I'll play it on. And you see in 2013 how small New York is. Thank goodness, it's nice to see New York small. Um, uh, and Maine, of course, is, is really big. And you notice how large the lobster is. It's now uh, threatening to eat Canada. Um, <laughs> So huge, huge change in the scale of this fishery, but also in the spatial extent of this fishery, where so much of the landings are now coming from Maine, from this northern component. Um, and, and our work really suggests that that has to do with temperature, that the fact that the, the Gulf of Maine has warmed has moved the optimal habitat for lobster from kind of the western Gulf of Maine, Cape Cod Bay, Massachusetts Bay, now to Maine. And then in the future, it's going to continue to move so that uh, by 2050, 
the prime lobster habitat is probably going to be in places like the, like the Bay of Fundy uh, and then in, in the northern part of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And it's going to be very challenging to find a lobster uh, south of Cape Cod by 2050. So past warming led to the collapse of lobster in the south, an explosion of lobster in the north, and that future warming is likely to prevent a recovery in the south. And it's going to lead to a decline in the north in Maine. Uh, but our work is actually starting to get a little bit of optimism that maybe it's not the decline is manageable, that there may be a way to really uh, blunt that decline uh, and lead to a bit of a soft landing uh, in Maine. OK, so uh, just a few, a few lessons that, that I'd like you to take home uh, when we think about the Gulf of Maine. Um, so the first is that global warming is real. And it's impacting things that we care about. And I think this is the number one lesson, where we can look at New England and we can look at things that have traditionally been important in, in New England. You think about cod. You can think about lobster. And these are species that are clearly being impacted by the warming that we've had in the Gulf of Maine. We've also seen uh, the closure of the fishery for northern shrimp, uh, which has a similar global distribution to cod. And so as the Gulf of Maine has warmed up, it's become unfriendly for, uh, for northern shrimp. But it's becoming more hospitable for species from, that we normally think of in the mid-Atlantic, species like black sea bass and squid. But of course, the impact, it's not just on the ecosystem. People are connected to the ecosystem. We have communities. We have major areas like Gloucester, Massachusetts, where the decline of the cod fishery has been an, an, an incredibly terrible event in the history of that community. It's leading to uh, a major, major socioeconomic stress in that region. Uh, it's really uh, a challenging time for the people in Gloucester, and not just for, the, for people who, uh, who are cod fishermen, but also for people who sell them ice, people who service their boats, uh, people who are you know, dependent on them uh, and, and that fishery for a living. Uh, whereas in Maine, we're now seeing a boom in lobster. We're seeing high school students who can make over $100,000 a year in a summer. Right? Think about those of you in high school. What would you do if you were making $100,000 a year in, uh, in, you know, in the summer? Would you go back to school in the fall? Thank you. That's exactly the right answer. But that's not the answer that, that a number of people are making. And, it's, and so it's really challenging where we're talking about people who are making decisions based on the current conditions in the fishery and not really thinking about the future in that fishery and whether there's going to be the same level of income, whether there are going to be the same number of opportunities that there are now uh, in that fishery. Um, the other lesson is that planning is important and that acknowledging climate change in planning can lead to better outcomes. So uh, cod obviously is, I think, the contrafactual to that, where not accounting for temperature in the planning for cod led to a poor outcome. We think that had, we, had the management process been able to account for the warming, that we would have had a better outcome for that species. Um, but one of the things that I take a lot of, uh, a lot of pride in uh, as somebody who's lived in New England for a long time is that we actually are having conversations in New England that are conversations that, that people around the country need to start having. We are having some really interesting conversations about what does it take to build cities that are resilient to things like sea level rise. Uh, so this is a, 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 a visualization. You can see this at sea change at saski.org. It's a really, really cool site. Uh, what they've done is they took Boston and they added sea level rise on top of it. So here's the current coastline of Boston. In 2050, you see a little bit of uh, areas that would be underwater on high tides. 2050, if we were to get a Hurricane Sandy-like storm, like a major coastal storm with a significant storm surge, you would have a lot of Boston that would be underwater. Okay, this isn't that different actually than what would happen if if this event were to uh, you know this sort of event were to hit now. Okay, if if Boston if Hurricane Sandy had hit Boston, there would have been a lot of flooding in some really important and valuable areas in the city here. Uh, 2100, though, notice how an average day in 2100 looks like Hurricane Sandy in 2050. 
Okay? And Boston, I think, is really leading the way in starting to have some of these conversations about what does it mean for the city? Where are the places where we're going to maybe uh, you know, armor the city and be able to really dig in and protect, our, protect important places? Where are the areas where maybe we're going to retreat? These are very tough conversations that, that cities all over the, the world need to start having. And, and I think New England is one of the places that's, that's at the uh, forefront of those conversations. I'm also always really excited when I come to Massachusetts, because every time I come, I, my, I think my kids and my wife get really annoyed, because I'm always like, oh, look, the solar panels. Hey, look over there, wind turbine. You guys have so much great installation of alternative energy uh, as somebody in Maine where uh, we've really, I think, lagged behind for uh, primarily political reasons, uh, I'm really jealous of, of, of all of the great work that the state here has done to uh, improve alternative energy. But overall, New England has done a very good job at reducing its greenhouse gas emissions and having uh, uh, putting itself on a more sustainable pathway and is really leading uh, the country in showing that that's possible. And that's an important thing for our future. So uh, lastly, I want to bring things a little bit back to fisheries, because this is the work that, uh, that we're starting to do. And it's really trying to think deeply about fisheries, about what are the decisions that get made in the fishing industry or for the fishing industry, and where, what are the kinds of information that they, uh, that they need. So each of these blobs represents a different, uh, you can think of it as a different group of people and the decisions that they might make. So the yellow blob represents individual fishermen. And so they're making decisions every year, every season. And their decisions are made thinking about their local environment. One of the most important decisions that they have to make, and it gets to my, uh, my example with lobstermen, is should you stay or go? Right? Are you going to stay and c commit to the fishery this year, or are you going to do something else and get out? And I think there's really important advice that we can start giving fishermen about the long-term future of their, uh, of their industries. Uh, on, at the community scale, right? you think about a town like Gloucester, you think about a town like Stonington, Maine, that has a really important fishery uh, uh, economy. What infrastructure does that city need in order to support the fisheries that it's likely to have in the future? Do, are, how are they going to deal with sea level rise? Are they going to continue to be a fishing port, or are they going to put in you know, moorings for yachts? These are important decisions. Uh, the management system needs to, needs to account for trends, and that's what we were trying to do with that cod example. We're really interested in how can we develop forecasts that might play out on a short ter shorter term for management and also for, uh, for the fisheries themselves. Can you give the fishing fleet an idea of what it can catch, where it can catch, and how to operate more efficiently in a world where maybe you have to pull back on the quotas uh, to help them be more resilient? And that's, of course, the last lesson, is how do we manage for resilience? Resilience both in terms of the ecological resilience of the species, but also resilience in terms of the economies of the, uh, of the fisheries. So Gulf of Maine is warming rapidly. We've seen the impact of warming on both the natural environment and also on the people that depend on it. Adaptation requires acknowledging climate change. The first step to recovery is admitting that you have a problem. And good management uh, is necessary to build resilience. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you here tonight. And I would love to have some questions. <laughs> Ma'am in the back. GMRI, yep. Uh, what do you exactly do to make the community like listen to you more? The, yeah, great, great question. We do a lot of a lot of work directly with uh, with fishing communities. So we have been uh, working very closely with the groundfish fishery as it's gone through this transition in management from fishermen being allocated certain number of days that they can fish to having to now ma now having to manage a, a portfolio of quota of different fish and helping them to work more closely together. That work started right as the warming trend was starting and the quota cuts started coming in. And so now we've started working directly with fishermen to, to try to get them involved in the management process, to try to uh, get their 
their, help them understand you know, what's going on in the water and really connect them with science. Uh, we're involved in other conversations like uh, we're working with the town of Portland and South Portland around sea level rise planning and that work involves bringing data very much like the, the Saski example where we're really trying to take the global climate model data and localize it for, from the point of view of people living in Portland and South Portland and trying to help them have a conversation because so many of the conversations that we have around climate change get to in, into an ideological space and what we're trying to do is cut through a little bit of the ideology and ground our conversations in the data because there's a lot of data that's out there, there's a lot of models uh, and, and we, our hypothesis, and we'll see whether it's true or not, is that by having conversations that are grounded in the data that we can get to a more productive place. So. Okay, over here. How does the decline in cod and lobster population affect other aquatic life? Oh, excellent question. So the question was, how would the decline in cod and lobster affect other aquatic life? I'm going to narrow your question and say, how does the decline of cod affect the decline of lobster? Because these two species have a really interesting ecological relationship in that cod are important predators on lobster. And so part of the boom in lobster in Maine is actually related to the long-term decline of cod. Uh, and so by having fewer cod around, it's allowed lobster to, to really boom uh, in Maine. And uh, we're, we're in the midst of trying to finish up a project where we're doing a similar climate projection for lobster, similar to what we did for cod, except we have to really grapple with that about what do, what's the future of the fish community going to be. And one of the things we're thinking about is that as the Gulf of Maine warms up, we're going to see more species from the Mid-Atlantic, from you know, species that we think of around Rhode Island, coming up into the Gulf of Maine. And that's going to change the, the, the field of predators that eat lobsters. And so that's something that we're, that we're starting to include in our models and trying to really understand those effects. So great question. So I'm going to go here. Go ahead. Um, I read a book. About 10 years ago, I think it's about 15 years old, by Trevor Corson, uh, The Secret Life of Lobsters. And um, one of the issues there was, um, if I remember it correctly, that um, the majority of the newborn lobsters were coming from females that were living a, at the bottom of the ocean pretty far away and not being caught, actually, by the fishermen. Um, a, is that still the, the case, this view, and B, is the tr temperature trend at the bottom of the ocean the same as at the surface? Or? So I'll, I'll answer your last question first. So the, the, your last question was really, I've talked about sea surface temperature trends, but many of the species that I've talked about, lobster and cod, are living further down in the water, and lobster, you know, they're living on the bottom of the water. We've done work that's, that's looked at the temperature trends at depth, uh, and we see very strong relationships between surface temperature and the temperature trends going down to about 300 feet, about 100 meters. So that encompasses most of the habitat for lobster. So it gives us some confidence that the sea surface temperature trends are reflecting the trends at depth. And I've really pushed my, uh, my team to whenever possible to try to use sea surface temperature because that's the thing that we're most likely to have confidence in coming from the climate models. So it allows us to take our models that we're building on the you know, historical data and project them forward. So your, uh, your second question was about the, the role that the, the large females uh, play in the, uh, in the production of lobster. And our work shows, the models that we're running show that that's actually critical. Uh, to maintaining the viability of this population. So Maine is really interesting in that we're the only place uh, uh, in the U.S. that has an upper limit on lobsters. So we, there's a minimum size of lobster, and in Maine there's a maximum size where we don't, uh, we don't allow landings of lobster much bigger than this, and we don't allow landings of lobsters that are carrying eggs. Our work shows that that's actually been crucial for our fishery to take advantage of the boom and also will be crucial in, in sort of slowing the decline in building some resilience in that population. And it underscores one of the lessons that, that we're finding and that people really are all over the world, some of our collaborators are finding, that good fisheries management, good precautionary fisheries management confers resiliency and will help these fisheries be able to, to, to extend and be productive further on into the future. Yes? 
cod and how they're decreasing in number. What other species uh, beyond lobster have um, had an increase in their population with the decline in cod? Great, great question. So the question was with the decline in cod, what other species have, have increased other than lobster? Um, it's a, it's, that's a great, I, I don't actually know. <laughs> and that one of, but, but one of the groups that people talk a lot about is that not, it, it, the, the increase in lobster, it hasn't just been lobster. It's been the whole community of, of decapod crustaceans, so lobsters and crabs that have also increased. So we have a lot more crabs running around uh, in the Gulf of Maine uh, than we used to. And that probably is, is similar to, uh, to cod. And they, they probably have played a role in that. Um, we often think of cod as, an, as being really dependent on, uh, on some of the forage fish, like herring, the small silvery fish in the Gulf of Maine and sand lands. We haven't seen an, a, like a, a boom in those species uh, as cod has declined. But I think that's probably more due to the fact that, that there are lots of other things that are eating them as well. And so as cod have declined, other species may have increased their abundance uh, to counter that. I mean, dogfish are one that, that people might point to both as a competitor for cod, but also as then a potential predator on cod. Okay, so ma'am? Has there any, been any studies um, trying to monitor whether or not the, any of these species can adapt to the change? Yeah, so there are a number of studies going on around, uh, around adaptation in kind of a Darwinian evolutionary sense. Um, there is some, uh, there's some evidence that some species can adapt. I, I think the adaptation is probably more interesting when people talk about ocean acidification than, uh, than in the temperature range because temperature is something where, yes, you could adapt, but, but for many of the species that we talk about, certainly the fish that I've talked about, they're more likely just to move, that you'll see a population boom in one place and decline in another, like what we saw in lobster, where acidification is more of a large-scale stress. It's, fair, it's more uniform than, uh, than temperature, and it's harder to get away from it. Uh, and so I think, it's, I'm, I think I'm really interested in whether, uh, in whether we start to see evidence that some species can adapt to, uh, to, you know, to lower pH. So. Okay, all the way in the back. I'm sorry, I keep, actually, I'm going to go with you, and then we'll go all the way in the back, ma'am. In the, in, in the jacket, yeah. Two questions, totally unrelated. One has to do with the Bay of Fundy, and the fact that the water is kind of going into a dead-end channel, and then eventually backing back out again. How much effect does that have on the fact that the water then doesn't circulate, allowing cold water to come in and hot water to leave? Yep. And might that be part of the cause of the heating up of the... Uh, so, uh, so the Bay of Fundy is a really important and interesting place uh, oceanographically. I mean, not only are you right, I mean, it's sort of a cul-de-sac where you get the cold water that comes around the corner. And not all of it goes around the corner. Some of it comes directly into the Gulf of Maine. But some of the cold water comes around Nova Scotia and will, will enter the Bay of Fundy. Uh, the Bay of Fundy is like a giant blender. We have, you know, these tremendously large tides that are that are mixing up the water, uh, and and it's not so much that they're going to prevent that cold water from getting around. Otherwise, you would see the Bay of Fundy cooling and the rest of the Gulf of Maine warming up. But rather, I think what's really interesting about that area, so the Bay of Fundy and then the eastern coast of Maine, east of Penobscot Bay, is that that area has really strong tidal mixing. And that's going to that's gonna allow it to be colder a little bit longer. And so it's, it looks like in some of the modeling work that we're doing that it may serve as a kind of a refuge for, uh, particularly for lobster, which is what we're interested uh, in. Second question. Okay. Because the lobster population is increasing, are more lobster licenses, fishing licenses, than being given out? Because I know in the past few years, it's been very difficult to get one. It, it's still very difficult to get, to get a lobster license, but there's, there's definitely more pressure to, to do it. It's, it's fairly easy to get a license, uh, and, and here I'm getting a little, I'm going to get in trouble here because I don't fully understand lobster licensing in Maine, which is a complicated thing, but I believe that it's fairly easy to get a student or a, kind of a junior apprentice license. It's then harder to translate that into a, uh, you know, a long-term uh, license for yourself. Um, 
there's always pressure to, to try to expand it because there's a waiting list, but then there's always pressure to not open it up because you don't want to have too many, you don't, the lobstermen who are in the fishery don't want competition. So my understanding is that the number of licenses has actually been fairly flat and hasn't increased, and that the increase in landings that we're getting is due to uh, catching more lobster in every time they haul a trap, but also spending more days on the water, going in bigger boats, and fishing more traps. Uh, so, so the effort's increasing, but, but the number of people fishing necessarily hasn't. Okay, so sir in the back. My question, in addition to temperature, are there also predators, excuse me a moment, <coughs> predators that are eating the cod eggs and the young cod, and with the uh, change in the animals in the ocean, I wondered if that's part of the reason the cod have diminished. I, you're, I think you're exactly right. So when, when I talk about a temperature effect, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit cagey in that I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that it's a direct effect, that somehow you know, if you were to hold a cod in a bowl and warm it up, that it would produce fewer eggs. What we're, ta what we're talking about is sort of complex. It could include those direct effects, but it almost certainly includes more of the indirect effects of temperature. So uh, additional predators coming in or competitors or changes in the habitat at where the juveniles are going to settle and it's going to be important for their survival. So one of the things that we talked about in the paper, and I was talking to, to, to John uh, from the aquarium about this over, over dinner, is that as you warm up uh, the Gulf of Maine, one of the things we're seeing, if you think about uh, predators that migrate into the Gulf of Maine, so something like dogfish that spend their winters uh, south of Cape Cod and then come into the Gulf of Maine uh, in the summer, in the spring and summer and stay through the fall. Well, if the Gulf of Maine is warming up, one of the consequences is that spring starts a little bit earlier and fall extends a little bit later. And so by, just by increasing the length of the season, you increase the number of days when, uh, when cod are going to be in contact with these migrating predators. And that, that alone can account for a lot of the mortal, extra mortality uh, that we think we're seeing in the population. Okay, so in the back, you in the, in the pink. How do rising temperatures affect invasive species and the biodiversity of the Gulf of Maine? Wow, great question. Um, so invasive species are, are something that, we, you, you know, that we're really interested in and really concerned with. So one of, the, one of the questions I get is the difference between an invasive species and species that are kind of moving in due to climate change. So in, in Maine, we would say a black sea bass is not something we would normally catch uh, you know, fishing in Maine, but it's something that we're starting to see more and more. We talk about those species that are just kind of extending their range as more emerging species. Invasive species are species where humans have sort of transported them from one part of the planet to another. Um, so one of the big invasive species that we have in the Gulf of Maine is our green crabs, uh, which we've had here for almost 150 years. So they, they, they're not exactly new, but uh, in Maine in 2012, uh, during our, our, our heat wave year, green crabs exploded and started really doing a, a tremendous amount of damage in some of our coastal environments, tearing up eelgrass uh, and, and feeding on uh, baby clams and things that people were trying to harvest. So that's a really big question, that's a, that's a really important question. For biodiversity, that gets to a little bit of a, a scientific argument, and here you're going to get my, my ultimately nerdy answer, in that I'm going to be a stickler for what, what biodiversity is in an ecological sense, which is really just the number of species in an ecosystem. Um, if you just count up the number of species in the Gulf of Maine, we, you come to some number. Especially in the fish, there actually are more species in a place like Rhode Island. And so our biodiversity in the Gulf of Maine is likely to increase as we warm it up, as, the, as these warmer, more diverse communities move into the Gulf of Maine. But even though we may have more species, they're going to have a different ecological function. And so we're going to have probably less productivity. We're going to have fewer of these big, really productive species like cod. And we're going to replace them with species that are smaller and less productive, like perhaps black sea bass. Yeah? Um, well, even with all of this evidence that's presented with the severity of global warming, 
Do you think that people will still continue to undermine the, the, the disastrous effects and severity of it? Or do you think that the increased conversation will allow for, I guess, like a more uh, understanding of like the possible dangerous outcome? I, well, I, I certainly hope that, you, you know, that we will be able to have a conversation. I mean, I think everybody, and there was a lot of, a lot of news stories this, uh, this morning that commented on the presidential debates on all of the important policy discussions that didn't happen in the, you know, in the debates this fall for uh, a variety of reasons that I'm sure we all have lots of different opinions on. But climate change, I think, is, is at the top of everybody's list as an important issue that people are seeing, that scientists are talking about, that, that resource managers are talking about, that it, big major companies are talking about, uh, and really trying to understand what that means, yet our political system seems, very, seems to really struggle uh, to have that you know, really productive, informed conversation. Because I, I think that you know, there are a lot of ways that we could decide to try to bend that temperature curve down. And we could actually decide that we don't want to. It's not the decision I would make, but it's, it, I would like at least if we're going to stay on that upward trajectory, that we would at least be honest with ourselves about what the trade-offs are and what the costs are going to be. And I don't think we're, we're, we're there yet, at least at the national level. I think we're ha we, we, we have those conversations at a much better level at the state, uh, at the state level right now, uh, with I think New England having a, a better environment for that. There are other places that uh, are, are, are a little bit more challenged, uh, Florida being a, and a really important one. You in the back. Okay. Um, what do you think is the best step for the community to take to help? Climate change? Wow, uh, great, great question. So to help climate change, I'm, we are really focused um, at my institution on, on, on providing advice over this kind of next 20 years. So thinking about adaptation. And so we're really focused on, on sort of bringing data into these conversations in fisheries management or in coastal planning. Uh, and so there, a lot of it is just, you know, it's just participating. Right? So if, you're, if this is something that's you know, interesting to you, you know, find a way uh, you know, to get involved, either in, you know, in the city here or in your school. Because uh, there are lots of things that we can do locally to try to help make the institutions that we care about be resilient to the changes that we know are coming. I think you know, globally, there's the challenge of how do you reduce carbon emissions. And certainly, I think you know, we, we each have a moral responsibility to, to try to do that and to try to show you know, personal leadership on that front. But you know, to, really do, to really do it, it's going to require big policy things, big international policy things. Uh, and that's a very, very different challenge and one that I'm probably not qualified to address. Should we just have maybe one or two more questions? Yeah, perfect. Okay, I think, yes, go ahead. So do you like tartar sauce or <laughs> vinegar? Uh, great question. I'm, I think I'm more of a vinegar guy because it goes better with the French fries. <laughs> yeah. So stir in, the, oh, stir in the green and then we'll wrap up. Oh, yeah, am I in the green? Uh, I saw the, this fellow here in the, is that green? Maybe it's not green. <laughs> all right, but I'll take your question. Uh, if somebody there had a question, it's all right. Go for it. So do you know if like the diversification of um, species dying out, like the cod and stuff due to climate change occurs in the forests and lands, like land too, or is it only happening in the ocean? No, you're, you're great, great point. You know, the, the things that we're talking about in the ocean are also taking place on land, but they can take place on different scales. So one of the great things about fish is that as their environment changes, many of them can move with it. It's much harder for an oak tree to move, right? They're literally rooted in place. Um, but so you're seeing the, you know, the forest ecosystems maybe change a little bit more slowly. Uh, but birds, I think, are a really important indicator of climate change and some of the, uh, uh, you know, some of the species that people really look, look to. One other quick story, uh, uh, you know, here, since we're here in Massachusetts, if you go uh, over to, to Walden Pond where Thoreau wrote his book, um, I'm not a huge Thoreau fan, but one of the things that Thoreau did was that he actually kept some really interesting observations on when he saw a particular species start to bloom, 
right? Flowers uh, that he would see walking around uh, in, you know, in Massachusetts. Uh, there's a, uh, a group, and I forget where, they, uh, where they're from, I think Boston University, that has started uh, going back through Thoreau's logs and actually doing some comparisons and finding things like the same species, in fact, in some cases, the same plants that Thoreau was observing are flowering, but they're now flowering uh, three to four weeks earlier than when he saw it. And so huge change in the timing of many of these events, and that has these knock-on consequences for things like birds and, and bees and pollinators and stuff like that. Andy, I think it's uh, the pre group at BU. Thank you. Great. It was, it was a great talk last year, and that's a long time ago for me. Um, <laughs> Andy, thank you for a really wonderful talk. Well, thank you very much. It was fun to be here. We really think this, this spells the end of consumerism. Now, consumerism was an engineered trend, right? We had, during the course of the 20th century, we had a real economic problem on our hands, which was the problem of overproduction. With cheap fossil fuels, we could make so many consumer products so fast in such large quantities that, that you know, there was the danger of just overwhelming markets. And that's one of the things that led to the Great Depression. So with the help of advertising and consumer credit, we engineered a whole new kind of economy, the consumer economy, where instead of citizens, we became dutiful consumers. And it was our duty to go out and buy stuff so as to create jobs, so as to keep the economy moving. And you know, if the, if the World Trade Center is, is, is attacked and buildings fall, what are we asked to do as citizens? Go out and buy stuff. Do your job as a consumer. Well, that, we're, we are moving into a different kind of economy, the end of the consumer economy and the dawn of the conserver economy.